Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really passionate about both about empowering women to take control of their finances and also I'm going to spend a little time at the end talking about the career of financial planning because I'm really passionate about getting more women into what I think is a great, a great career. So thank you for coming. And um, there are two of us today. And so I'm going to uh, deliver a lot of the content, but I've asked Jen to come help me because we ca have kind of tag, ta tag teamed in the past in courses she teaches. And so she's also got a background in finance and we used to work together. And so I thought it'd be fun to have her in here doing a little teaching as well. Um, now a couple of just housekeeping items. I've got several handouts and things on the, whatever you call it, banisters there. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, be sure to take my business card and email me. I'll also put it on my website and I'm assuming they've got it somewhere with the program materials for today, right? Good. Um, and then um, also I just wanted to ask a few questions to kind of help me gauge who you are. So if, uh, how many of you are current students? Okay, so big, big chunk. Um, how many of you are graduate students, like MBA, PhD, whatever? Uh, okay, okay, good. Um, how many of you are married? Okay, and how many of you ha have kids? Okay, a few folks with kids. Okay, good, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, all right, so now I gotta figure out how to use the clicker. <laughs> ha ha, okay. So this is kind of what we thought we'd cover today. We got a lot of feedback from the, the organizers of the event trying to determine what you might be interested in. So we've developed a presentation, but if you came with another question that we don't cover, feel free to ask that towards the end. Um, and I'm also open as we go along to having you ask questions as we go along so that you remember your question. I always hate having to write it down and remember till the end to ask. Um, and we'll hopefully also have time at the end to ask more questions. Um, so I'm going to cover a little bit about why you should care about this topic. I'm judging by the fact that you're here that you do care. So it might be like preaching to the choir, but I've got my own rationale. Um, then I'm going to go into some top financial planning tips that I've developed over the years. Somewhere in the middle there, I'm going to pull Jen in to talk about why it's important to start saving now for retirement. Uh, and then I've got my little plug at the end for why you should consider this as a career. And then we'll have some Q&A. So that's kind of what we're planning to cover. And we have about an hour and a half. We started late, so theoretically we're supposed to end at noon, but we may push till 12.15. If you are all engaged and have questions and all that, feel free to leave if you're starving, though. Uh, so first up, why you should care. Um, I've given this talk to co-ed groups and, you know, women-only groups. Um, and the real reason that you should care first is because you know we're all living longer and if you still plan or hope to retire by 65 or even before you're gonna have a very long period of time potentially in retirement potentially as, as long or longer than you actually worked and so to fund that many years without an income requires a huge amount of savings and people really underappreciate how much that actually takes it used to be that people would retire at 65 and life expectancy was 67, 68, and so you had a couple years and it didn't require too much. <laughs> but nowadays, living till mid-80s, 90, 95, 100 some people, um, that requires a fair amount of resources. So it's important just from that aspect. Um, the other aspect uh, that I'm particularly passionate about is empowering women to take control. I still see too many women and we're raised, you know, still culturally to think that women can't do finance, they can't do math. I mean, you've got two examples here that say that's not true. Uh, and so we're still likely, and I still see a lot of women who let their partner take control of and manage their finances, and they just, they don't really understand what's going on, or maybe they do the bill pay, but they don't really understand the bigger picture. And it's really in your best interest to really change that and really pay more attention, learn as much as you can. You don't have to become an expert, but you need to know enough to be able to ask smart questions so you can determine if the people who are helping you with your finances are doing a good job. Otherwise, you're, you leave yourself vulnerable um, to being taken advantage of. And the other um, thing that I think I was going to point out here, maybe that's later on. Um, so there's a book I like to give out uh, to my clients uh, that's called Prince Charming Isn't Coming. This is what it looks like. <laughs> I don't love the title because, you know, it kind of implies romance and he's, you're not going to find the right man, but it's really not about that. What it's about is, um, 
you know, it's, it's on you to kind of take ownership of your finances. Don't assume someone else or something else, like the perfect job or the lottery is going to come along and save you. So you really need to, um, it's in your interest to really educate yourself. And so this is a great read. It's easy to read. It's got a lot of great tips in it. So I would encourage you to pick up the copy. All right, moving on. How are we doing? Uh, okay. Let's see. Oh, nope, one backwards. Okay, top 10 financial put tips. So I um, developed this list over the years because in my work with clients, I kept seeing certain themes and strategies and recommendations come up again and again in my work. And so while, you know, it's not one size fits all because everyone's situation is slightly different, there's enough commonality between what most people need to be thinking about and doing that it, it felt good to kind of come up with this list. Um, so I'm going to go over them in more detail in the coming slides. I'm not going to read them to you, but you all can read them. Now let's see. Is that forward or backwards? Ah, okay. Uh, all right, so my first idea, tip, is to invest in yourself. Uh, I think we all tend to focus, those of us who are focused on our finances are familiar with creating a balance sheet that includes our bank accounts and our investment accounts and you know the value of our house and then on the liability side we deduct our mortgage and our student debt and any other debts we have to come up with our net worth. People don't really think about their human capital though as an asset and actually younger er, earlier in your career it's actually a huge asset um, and Jen's gonna ex give a refresher on present value and time value of money but basically the value of your human capital is the discounted value of your future earnings. Now all of you are in the process or have you know, educated yourself, pursued a graduate degree, all that helps to increase your future earnings power. And so that's increased your human capital. And so it's a huge asset on your balance sheet, but most people don't really think of it as an asset. And so it's in your interest as you go through your career to be very proactive in, sorry, I'm not meaning to ignore you, I just realized I'm facing this way. Um, to be very pro proactive and strategic about your human capital. Even if you choose to take some time off to raise kids and have a family or take a break from your career, never stop thinking about your human capital in ways you can maintain it and, and continue to increase it. Um, and, e and that even means after kind of getting your MBA and you know feeling like, okay, I've got enough education. Because the world we live in is very fast paced and constantly evolving, particularly if you're going off into something like Silicon Valley and technology, and even in finance. So, you know, I have my MBA, I then got my CFA and my CFP, so I don't need any more certifications as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but at the same time, I continue to go to conferences, read articles, I'm always trying to stay on top of what's going on in my field. So I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, and then, uh, just to plug to all of you women, is that um, I think women, tend to be more prone than men, p potentially, uh, to neglect their human capital because we are more likely to be the one that takes time off to raise a family. And now that I'm 16 years out of business school, uh, I've had an opportunity to see a lot of my classmates and other people that I've seen um, that have their MBAs or advanced degrees take time off and, you know, just not think about their human capital and not think about what's next. Yes? Can you share your definition of human capital? Yes, it was the, um, it's the value of your future earnings stream. So you can, you know, as with valuing a stock or something like that, you just discount at some uh, rate of return your future earnings, you know, what your compensation would be each year for as long as you plan to work. And she's going to give a refresher on the math behind mm -hmm. that. Um, but it's a human asset and it tends to decline as you get closer to retirement because you have less years to work. Um, but thank, good question. Did that make sense? Okay. Um, so at any rate, just message to the women in the room. Even if you take time off, be thinking about kind of what's next and volunteering and you know, just finding ways to stay engaged and figure out what you're going to do you know, after the kids go away to college, for example. And I think Jen's actually a great example of this because you know, she used to be in finance with me and then she kind of took the time while her kids were young and started exploring what she wanted to do next and now she's a math teacher. So um, I think it's you know, very important to stay engaged. All right, enough, enough preaching <laughs> on that. Um, so moving on, uh, let's see. So the next step um, is to kind of start at the top and take stock of what's important to you and what your goals are because it, it doesn't make sense to kind of work on the nitty gritty numbers if you don't understand what's important to you and where you're going. 
Uh, one of my favorite quotes is Lewis Carroll, um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So it's really important to kind of have an idea of what's important to you and where you're going. Um, you can Google the term life list or, um, and there are examples out there on the internet of people that have developed a life list of what's important to them. Uh, John Goddard has one out there, uh, Ted Leonis. And I even created my own that just has different categories and things I want to achieve in the different categories. And I keep it kind of on my desktop and review it periodically and check things off as we go along. Like um, last summer we took our kids to Costa Rica and that had been something on our life list. And then I'll add things as new things come up. It's just a good way to kind of keep yourself focused on what's really important because it's so easy to get involved in the day to day and lose track. Um, well, let's see what else. And then once you've kind of come up with your own list, if you're in a relationship, it's a good idea to compare it with your partner and then kind of create some blended list where you prioritize what's most important and then figure out how much these different goals actually are going to cost you. And then, you know, use your resources and start, you know, tackle your needs first and then your priority list and just start working your way down based on resources. Um, I like to tell my clients you can have it all, just not necessarily at the same time. So sometimes, it, it, you know, we aren't all blessed with unlimited resources, so we have to kind of prioritize. Um, so, and then just one last little bit about this. Make sure you're not, you know, there's a fine balance to be had between living a good life now and being able to live a good life in the future. So make sure you're not so focused on doing your life list now that you're compromising your ability to live a good life later on. So it's, it, it requires balance. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, next little bit. You know, before you can really achieve your goals, you have to get your arms around your cash flow. And we were just talking to Sarah, right, is going to work at Intuit this summer. And I'm like, oh, you're going to work on Mint? Because I love Mint, and I tell all my clients that they should explore it and start using it, because it really helps you understand where your money's going. And it's pretty easy once you get it set up. So I call this living within your means. It's one of those values that I try to teach my kids and that I tell my clients um, that if you want to save for goals, you got to get your expenses down below your current income. Uh, and it's really key to building wealth and achieving your goals. So the first step is to look back, and, and that's where Mint comes in. You figure out where your money's been going. But then the other part that people often don't follow through on is to start planning forward. So once you have an idea where the money's going, you look at it and you're like, is this going to get me where I want to go? Is this going to allow me to save for a house down payment or a new car or retirement? And if it's not, then you need to reorganize things and you know, recategorize. OK, I don't want to spend this much going out because I value more being able to retire someday. So you need to reorganize and ha make your cash flow go where you want, to, want it to go. Uh, it, just, it, it allows you to be more intentional about where your money is going. Uh, and there's a cash flow system that I use that it's a little onerous to set up because it involves opening a bunch of different accounts and then labeling them with nicknames. I use Capital One 360 for purposes of that. And then we have monthly deposits going into each. So we've got money every month going into the vacation account. So then when you have your vacation, it's not like, holy crap, how are we going to pay for this? You know, you've already got the money there. So when the credit card bill comes, you're like, boom, I paid my vacation. And that also is a good way to put any lumpy expenses like car maintenance, house maintenance, saving for retirement, anything like that that's a big, big expense or a big goal is to use monthly transfers to accounts to make sure the money's actually there. Uh, yes? Is there a percentage that you recommend for the, uh, um, scattering the your <coughs> different accounts? There's no real... Um, it really depends on you and what's important to you and where you live. We happen to live in a very expensive area, and so your housing costs are going to consume an inordinate amount of your income. Um, usually I like people to get to where they've got 50%-ish um, going to their uh, fixed expenses, so housing, insurance, childcare, you know, food, things that you have to do to, to live. And then you have another percentage going into the yellow bucket is actually what I call the control bucket, and that's your discretionary spending. And that's actually the eating out groceries, gas, getting your hair done, whatever you do on a weekly basis. And then you should have another big chunk that goes, like 25% or so, that goes to both those lumpy expenses like vacation, home maintenance, auto maintenance, and also your savings goals, whether it's kids' college, funding an IRA, emergency savings if you don't have emergency savings, things like that. So there's no right or wrong answer, but 
The key is where you can, where you have control, like those discretionary expenses, not letting them dominate and making room for more important things. All right, are we good? Oh, yes. Um, most banks will allow you to set up recurring monthly, weekly transfers. So I've got my Capital One accounts all linked to my main checking account, and so it just happens as soon as, you know, at a certain time each month the transfers just happen. Um, so you don't really need an app for that. Uh, Mint is good, and they have an app for tracking past spending and categorizing it. Um, but I don't really know of an app that would allow you to manage future transfers. I'm sorry? Like something that's super customizable. Like something that's super customizable. For the transfers? Yeah. The future? Again, I, I'm not aware of an app. You might, might look at, no, I don't think personal capital does it either. Does anyone else know of something that? I think just logging onto your bank and linking your accounts and setting up recurring transfers is really the only way I know of to do that. Usually with your employer, you set that up and it, it, you designate what accounts to transfer the money to automatically each, uh, every pay period, both by pay period. You, some, yeah, some employers allow you to transfer part of your paycheck to multiple accounts, but that might, they might not want you doing it to like 10 different accounts. So, like so, three, I think is so my, what we do is we just have it go into our main checking and then from our main checking, the transfers go out to other savings accounts. So depends on what your employer is willing to let you do. All right, um, saving for a rainy day. So before you worry too much about saving for retirement, saving for different goals, you need to have a cushion because it can really um, enable you to be a lot more calm about your finances if you know that you're not living life on the edge and paycheck to paycheck. Um, so the first thing I recommend is um, building up an emergency savings account and it's not to be invested in the market, it's meant to be secure, safe, money that's there. I know money markets pay almost nothing these days, particularly at your, your brick and mortar banks. Um, but you want it to be there when you need it and it needs to be easily accessible. So the traditional wisdom if you go out there and Google you know, emergency savings is three to six months of, a li of living expenses, but that really varies depending on your risk tolerance, what kind of uh, situation you're in, like if you're part of a two um, income couple you can maybe go on the lower side because you both have jobs and the odds of both of you losing your jobs at once are pretty low, unless you both work for the same company. Um, <laughs> also, the more junior you are in your career, it's gonna be easier for you to find a job if you lost it, so you could go on the lower side, whereas if you're pretty senior, it takes longer to find your next job, so um, might wanna err on the higher side. And some of it's just what you feel comfortable with with. I have a client that she needs to have a year worth of her living expenses in the bank to feel like she can sleep at night. So it, it, some of it's just bad. Um, and I wouldn't put it in the market. Sometimes if it's earmarked for longer term or you really don't think you're going to need it, you can split it and have some of it in high yield savings and some of it in a short term bond fund. But you don't want to put it anywhere that's risky or that's hard to get to. Um, this is another reason I like Capital One 360 and those online banks is they tend to pay higher interest rates. I think it's paying like 0.75 right now instead of 0.01%. So it gives you just a little boost. It's still not keeping pace with inflation, but you got to do what you uh, can do. And then the last bit is if you use your emergency savings, say you have an unusually large medical bill or an unusually large car repair, you need to replenish it. It's not just like it's gone. Uh, so you need to bring it back up, and as your um, living expenses and lifestyle changes, you should kind of revisit what the right number is. Um, any questions on that? So you recommend doing that in just like savings account? Yeah, like, um, you know, it's your... Growing faster than inflation, potentially? It's not, right now it's not going to be growing faster than inflation. So how do you... But it's meant to be... That? Well, it's, it's meant to be safety, and interest rates aren't always this low, so mm -hmm. theoretically in the future they'll get back to more normal levels, but... For now, it's good just to have it in the bank and know that it's there and it's safe. It's not going to go down in value. Um, and then if you do want to put some of it in you know, an online bank to get a little bit more interest and then maybe even a little bit in a short-term bond fund to get a little bit more, um, just be cognizant of the fact that it's not guaranteed if it's in a bond fund. Uh, all right. Um, where is... Okay. So, and this is where we're getting close to having Jen come up. Um, 
My next bit is just to pay yourself first. And what this really means, if you're working for an employer, putting money into the 401k or the retirement account can be done so you don't even see the money. It's a great trick to get yourself used to living on less and having money go away for retirement. Um, most, another general rule of thumb is most people, as long as they've started at a reasonable time, need to be saving 10 to 15% of their income for retirement. Um, and you don't want to be leaving free money on the table. A lot of companies match your 401k, so try and at least get up to the percentage of the match so that you're not leaving free money on the table. Um, I already mentioned the autopilot where it comes out first. They've, uh, so this whole field of behavioral finance that has kind of emerged and become very popular, um, there's a lot of human biases, and so investment companies and other companies are developing kind of tricks and tools to help you deal with your human, human nature. Mm -hmm. And so another one that a lot of 401ks now offer is an auto increase feature, mm -hmm. which is that each year it'll increase the percentage of your income going into your 401k. So if at first you really feel like, gee, I can't put 10% in, but maybe I'll start with five, because that's what the corporate match is. Then in subsequent years, it goes up to 6% of your income, then 7%. And so it helps you get to where you want to go. Um, and another neat feature that a lot of plans are now doing is instead of having the default option be cash, they will default you into a target retirement fund that's kind of a general asset allocation fund. So you at least are getting into the market even if you don't have time or you know, what not to think about it. Um, and then Roth, who wants more information on Roth versus traditional? That was something they thought people might uh, have an interest in. So there are both Roth and traditional IRAs now, and there's also Roth and traditional 401ks. Uh, and the whole idea is Roth, after the money goes in, you don't get a tax deduction when it goes in, but after it's in the account, it's forever tax-free, so you can take it out in retirement and never pay taxes on it. So all the growth is tax-free, tax, um, and you're not required to take money out starting at age 70 and a half. So it's a good idea if you can to get money into Roth accounts, and generally speaking, you want to do it in years when you're at a lower income tax rate, so maybe you know, you only work for part of a year, or you take some time off, or, you know, if you're having kids, try and getting money in when you're in a lower tax rate than you think you might be in retirement. And I know that's really hard to figure out because who knows what tax rates will be. But generally speaking, if you're in a lower tax rate, um, it's a good idea to think about a Roth. Um, and so I can, yes? So related to that, so can, I know that they, I've heard though that we're historically at a low tax rate and that it's only going to get higher but yet when we retire, maybe we'll be lower, so kind of conflicting advice? Well, it's not conflicting, it's just there's multiple moving parts. Yeah. So we are at a, well, rates have gone up in the past couple of years, so they're not as low as they were. Um, there's a, certainly a chance that they might go up in the future, it's just really hard to predict because some of it's political and what have you. Um, and then it's also hard to know what rate you'll be in in retirement. Usually people, when they first retire, they, their tax rate is lower because they're not yet, they could, if they have other resources, they're not yet taking Social Security. They may just be living off the portfolio for a bit. Um, the RMDs from the IRAs don't start till 70 and a half, so maybe they're not pulling money out of their IRA. Um, so usually there's a period of lower tax rates, but then once you're taking RMDs, if you have a lot of money in IRAs, your tax bracket goes back up. So it's gen generally it's a good idea to have different buckets of money. So have money in different types of uh, tax treatment vehicles, so some money in a Roth IRA, some money in a traditional IRA or 401k, some money in a taxable account, because that way you can kind of manage your tax bracket in retirement better. Anyway, um, and so now I'm going to turn over to Jen. Oh, whoops. I have a 401k question. Uh -huh. What if your company doesn't offer a match? Is there anything you suggest doing to kind of recalibrate since there's no match you can take advantage of? Um, well, you can mention to them that, gee, that'd be a nice employee yes. benefit. <laughs> I'll get them about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's up to the company whether or not they offer, offer them, and in, in tough times, companies tend to cut the matches out right. and then reinstate them when times get better. Um, you can still control how much you put into your 401k, so take advantage of it to the maximum you're able. Um, but, you know, you can't really, other than mentioning that you would yep. be nice, control what they do. Um, if you feel like you're not saving enough, you, in addition to putting money in a 401k and maxing out a 401k, you can also put money into an IRA. Mm -hmm. It won't necessarily be tax deductible um, if you're participating in a 401k, but at least the growth is tax deferred. So that's a way to get more money for retirement. Yes, um, popular topic. Do you have topic. any 
recommendations on like how you should allocate across accounts? Like any like guy I've heard different like guidelines and frameworks like how much you should put into a four hundred one k or Roth or traditional just to spread it out. Do you have any like frameworks? No, I mean just to have a little bit of each. Most people aren't going to have too much control over how much they have in a Roth because their income's too high or whatnot. Um, so chances are you're going to have most of your money in an, a traditional IRA or 401k. But to the extent you have the possibility of getting money into a Roth IRA, particularly if you're in a low income tax bracket for a few years, that's a good idea. And then it's also nice to have money in taxable accounts so that you don't have to start taking money from your IRA when you first retire. You can live on your taxable account. You just need to make sure you invest it tax efficiently because so, each year you pay income tax on whatever interest, dividends, and capital gains it generates. So you want to be careful about being tax efficient. Any other questions? Yeah. So is the 10 to 15 percent that you recommend before a match would be considered into the equation? No, I mean you can incorporate the match into that, but it, it this is a very rough guideline, so it really depends on your personal situation. And as Jen's going to show, the longer you wait, the higher it gets in terms of how much you need to be saving. Mm -hmm. um, but if you start early and your company's got a generous match, that could certainly be included in that calculation. You just can't count on a match indefinitely, so it's good in years when they have it, but. You know. Any other questions? Yes. I have a rock related question. So I understand that you could take out the principal after mm -hmm. five, five years. years. Right. So would you advise doing that? Like we need it for education purposes. Yeah. I mean it's a good place and actually I my clients that have kids you know, we recommend 529s um, as the main vehicle, but if there's a lot of uncertainty, maybe grandparents might come in for college. It's nice to have the money in a Roth, because then if you need it, you can take it, but if you don't need it, you can keep it for retirement. So I wouldn't, you know, if you, if you need that savings for retirement, I wouldn't count on it as something you can use, but you can use it if, you know, if there's an emergency or um, you didn't really need that for retirement. Anything else? Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen just so we can get her in. She's going to share the math behind, and it'll be a refresher for many of you because I know many of you have just had finance. So she's going to give a quick refresher on the math on, that works behind the present value and time value of money so you understand why it's so important to start saving now. And let me turn off my. I'm going to turn myself on. And I'm going to turn me. Isn't she impressive? <laughs> yes, I've known her for a long time and I've seen her, well, grow. I guess we've both grown together, but <clears throat> very impressive. So I was all excited to wish you a happy pie day, but I hear that thunder was stolen from me. <laughs> so um, all I'm left with is l wishing you a uh, happy Einstein's birthday, which doesn't hold quite the same magic for me since I'm a math teacher. Um, if you do have kids, make sure to um, share with them the magic of pie. It is a remarkable thing. Um, so I am uh, Jen Lyons, uh, 1996 MBA, and uh, I think as you've gathered by now, I started in investment banking and money management, and I was an equity analyst. And more recently, I've been doing teaching in math and finance and uh, Tanya shared with you her passion for empowering women and so I thought I'd just open a little bit about what I'm passionate about. I frequently address these topics of uh, savings and finance. Oops, wrong one. That does seem backwards. Oh, you point the other way. I got it. Uh, I frequently address the topics of savings and finance with groups of graduating high school seniors and with uh, college-aged adults. And when I do, my aim is to show some of the math behind the advice. And I find that it's not very complicated, but I believe it makes it a lot more, more compelling. And because obviously our society would be a lot better off with better financial literacy, um, but people, you know, if you aren't showing them the reason behind it, then they're just being told. So the math helps them, uh, it, it gives a reason for why they should uh, the learn it, it gives them the strength of the argument, um, and it also shows students the real <coughs> world value of the math that they're learning in their math class. And so many of the topics here 
um, are that I show to kids in high school, um, they're not shown normally to kids in high school. And of course, this is the last time that we have them captive. So my passion would be, I believe that education should start, financial education should start in high school. And uh, this is the last time that, that we've got them all in a room. And so I believe in sort of the financial equivalent of, of driver's ed. Um, that would be, you know, something that would be in my dream. Uh, so let's get started with a reminder of the world we live in and um, so some sobering um, statistics here. Um, we live in a world where home borrowers who don't understand their loans are taken advantage of. There's a there was a study by the Atlanta Fed showing that 30% of borrowers who were in the lowest quartile of financial literacy um, didn't thought that they had a fixed rate home loan when in fact they had an adjustable rate home loan. And for us to expect that those people would be able to keep up with their payments or know when to refinance, of course, um, is, is not going to happen. Uh, those same people were four times more likely to have their uh, home loans foreclosed on. Um, so most of you are aware that this was a significant contributor to the 2008 financial crisis and the collapse of credit at that time. Credit card companies take advantage of college students um, and, and the poor. Uh, already they pay higher interest rates and borrowing rates and the effective rates are only higher uh, based on the fees that they're charged when they're unable to pay their balance in full each month or they don't understand the consequences of not paying their balance. And they're disproportionately paid by young people who don't have these understandings or by poor people. Uh, predatory lending, such as payday loans, they charge hundreds or even thousands of annual percentage rates of interest legally. So. Um, I teach this uh, example of a taxi driver named Doris who has these mounting medical bills and she gets caught in a spiral of payday lending where she borrows uh, lo payday loans, one loan to cover the next and her payday loan charges $30 for a $100 loan for, that is for a two-week loan. So uh, that would be a 30% rate for a two-week loan. And that's going to equate to, if you have a 30% loan for two weeks, and of course you've got 26 periods, you can annualize that to a rate of 780%. But that's not really the whole story. That's just annualized. If you think of the lender actually being able to relend that money every two weeks, he stands to make this amount of money, the $100, right, times one plus that 30% rate of interest raised to the 26 power for those 36, for those 26 periods, right? Because it's an actually an exponential function, which we are gonna get into in a moment to, to give the math behind that. What that works out to is $91,733, okay? Minus the $100 initial investment that he had to make. In a year, he's making $91,633. And now granted, he had to be pretty darn efficient to, to re-lend it and to be able to lend that much at the end of the year. But this equates to, if it's over 100, right? His initial investment. That's actually the percentage rate that he's coming out with at the end of the year. So that's a pretty good business to be in, right? That's a pretty good business to be in, and that's legal. So we're living in a world where you miss one deadline on a financial aid form or an application and you can wind up with nothing or potentially in debt. There's another story that I, I teach about which is from a New York Times article where they cover, it's a very uh, touching article about three um, minority, uh, they're, they're women, um, uh, poor minorities who are trying to get into elite colleges and the struggles with the logistics that they have of applying for financial aid. 
An exam one of the examples was Angelica who missed this deadline because she didn't know how to reach her absentee father and because she didn't have access to email and they were trying to reach her to remind her about the aid deadlines. And so all the aid got distributed and she ended up having to borrow $40,000 to attend Emory. Because she wasn't prepared for school and had to work a minimum wage job in order to um, get through, she was increasingly discouraged and she didn't end up graduated, graduating and she still had $61,000 in debt. And so stories like this, this was, you know, um, of course this is repeated over and over, um, but this can definitely happen because the logistics are just increasingly difficult for, for students like this. We live in a world where student loan debt has reached $1.15 trillion and that's exceeded credit card debt. Um, this really has left people with nothing left over to save. So it turns out 60% of college students borrow to get through college. And this is because the results are very promising. When you, when you go to college, college grads earn 50% more than, if, than a high school grad. Uh, and they earn 114% more than someone who doesn't even get a high school diploma. However, there was a Pew Research study that went further to show that 40% of households led by someone under 40 have some student debt, are carrying some student debt. And this is the kicker, households without student debt have a net worth seven times greater than households with student debt. And this, the bottom line of that is because they cannot save. And they can't save early because they're saddled with this student debt when they're young, right? And my talk, the bottom line of this, is that the crux of the difficulty here is, is that they're unable to save when they're young. They're unable to start early. And lastly, the vast majority of Americans are not saving enough for retirement. You hear this all the time. We're gonna go into this a little bit more in detail with some numbers. So traditional employer paid pensions, the old type of pension, have nearly disappeared, replaced by 401k savings. This doesn't surprise you. So in 1980, 60% of the private sector, of private sector workers had employer, employer paid pensions, and now only 10% do. What is surprising is that the average earner will need $900,000 at retirement to maintain his or her lifestyle requiring a contribution of 12 to 15 percent of income, which is similar to what Tanya was recommending when they are young, but up to 25 percent by age, age 35. Mm -hmm. um, that 900,000 is the average earner. They are going to need several million dollars. Retirement. Right, so right. Don't, don't use that as your goal. These are like, Ameri yeah, these are averages for the nation. What would you say the averages for the Bay Area? You I don't know what the average is, but my yeah. clients need yeah. like, three, four million dollars if they're planning to retire at 65 and have their money last through 75 and maintain their life. And maintain I mean, their lifestyle. to Idaho and live in a cabin. <laughs> <laughs> Be a greeter at Walmart. So average balance, the average balance in the 401k accounts in America is just over 60,000. People within 10 years of retirement have an average of 78,000. And more than half of U.S. workers have no retirement plan at all. So we're not in a very good place uh, as a country in terms of our, our uh, retirement savings. So we're under greater levels of student and consumer debt and lesser amounts of savings. So let's just see the comparison. This is a comparison of the levels of personal savings versus credit card debt as a, shown from a percentage of uh, income. This is interesting and, and distressing, but we're, we're, <laughs> we're here to talk to you about why you should change your personal saving habits. And so to do that, we're going to look at some of the basic math um, behind 
the advice. You can see that the 2008 financial crisis did do a bit to, to narrow the change or narrow the, the gap, make the trend change a little bit. But really that's because credit became tighter. What is disposable income? What is that in that previous slide? It was percent of disposable income? Oh, this would be um, presumably income that would not, would be available out of your paycheck right, after that you would after. be after, yeah, after the required stuff was taken out. So we're going to briefly um, talk about time value of money, and that's something that a lot of you have just uh, had in school. So um, most of you have learned it, but it's worth a refresher to give some context. And some of you haven't had it in a while, so we're going to just look over it again. A dollar today is worth more than a promise of dollar, a dollar tomorrow. Why is that? Who can tell me why that is? Yeah. Because you can make interest on your money today. Right. Okay. So interest, you can earn return on the money that you invest today. And of course, there's a risk in, in, in holding, uh, in waiting for that money that's promised to you tomorrow. Okay. And so what am I showing you now? It's interesting that to know that money grows, but, but also how it grows, right? So the difference here is... Compound interest versus simple interest, which doesn't really exist in our modern world, but these are two types of functions that you learned in Algebra 2. Think back, wipe away the cobwebs, right? <laughs> and what are those, those functions called? Linear and, exponential. linear and exponential, right. So these are linear function versus an exponential function. And from, from your old Algebra 2 class, you learned the difference between these two functions, and we all know from our finance class that money grows in the way depicted on the graph on the right. Okay? But what does that mean? So we're going to take an example and quickly remind ourselves that money grows in an exponential way and not a linear fa uh, fashion. And the example that we're going to use is very simple uh, and quick $100, 6% for a year. And it we're going to use a multiplier of 1.06 and we're going to see why it works this way. Okay, how interest accumulates? We start with $100. The next year, we earn 6% on our $100. And mathematically, because we've got 100 in both of those terms, we can factor out the 100 and we're left with 100 times 1.06. We all know that comes to $106, but we're not going to show that because we're going to bring the 100 times 1.06 here, whoa, here, and show that it's a common factor that can be pulled out again so that what we have here is 100 times 1.06 times 1.06 again or 100 times 1.06 squared. Okay? No mystery here. In the third period, it just continues and we note that the period matches the exponent at the end. And this is a multiplier effect. This is not additive, right? This is a, a geometric type effect. So at the end of the different periods, we're ending up with more than what we would have had had we just added $6 per year. And that our general function here is an exponential one. This of course happens because you earn interest on interest and of course this has profound implications on your savings and on your debt. All right? Most of you know this already. But let's look at an example. One sort of absurd example that you might have seen before is the doubling of a penny. And in this example, if you start with a penny, and you earn one penny per day, which would be equivalent to having 100% of simple interest per day for a month, for, for 30 days, you would end, end the month with 30 cents. But if you start with a penny and you double your money every day for 30 days, which is 100% compound interest, right? Because you're actually 
multiplying, you're doubling your money every single day. So you're multiplying your current investment, what is in the bank, by 100%, you're doubling it. You end the month with $5,368,709, okay? So there's a profound difference there, obviously. How about a more realistic example, which is over a 50-year time frame, and when you invest $1,000, if there were no compounding, you would end up with $6,000 at the end. But if there is compounding, you end up with a more respectable, sizable amount, $117,391. Graphically, it of course looks like this. <laughs> okay. So there's our exponential function, simple, okay. So the takeaway here is not that savings grow in this remarkable way so that you should save. Because after all, you can't even go out and find a bank that would give you simple interest. The big takeaway here is that the earlier you start, the more you will accumulate because the exciting part only happens pretty far down the line. Okay, really far down the line. And here's the example that's gonna show you that. So Sarah and Roger are the same age, and Sarah saves $1,000 per month from age 25 to 35 for 10 years. And then she stops. Roger is gonna save $1,000 per month from age 35 to 65, <coughs> so he's saving $1,000 a month for 30 years, and then he stops. When they both reach age 65 at the same time, it's Sarah that has more money. It's Sarah that has more money. She has a million 262, he's got a million 133. The takeaway here is that Sarah saved only a third as much as Roger. But Roger ended up, Sarah ended up with more money. The interest rate is 10% here? The interest rate is, I don't know, I don't have it on there. But there's a footnote. Yeah. Yeah. I can go find it, yeah. <laughs> but the reason is, is because she started earlier. So the, the takeaway here is you can't skip the boring part of saving and get right to the exciting part. Every day that you wait, you're not cutting off the flat part of the curve. You're cutting off the steep end of the curve, all right? So use your superpower. You have a superpower. And you have a superpower that older folks, like myself, do not have. And so you need to use it, right? You need to use it. So our discussion would not be complete if we didn't um, mention uh, how the math works also in the same way on the debt side. And again, a numbers example can do a lot to illustrate something that we've been told over and over, right? Which is, don't rack up credit card debt, pay off your balance every month, right? But when you're just told things and they don't have any meaning to you, then it's hard to follow the advice. It's hard to get your children to follow that advice, yeah. Once you pay off credit card debt, is it beneficial to close the account or keep it open? Keep it open to show creditors, future creditors, that you have a track record of paying down that account. And you also may want it in the future for emergency. I mean, Tanya may be able to speak to this as well. There might be situations where you need to clean up your um, right, financial situation yeah. and you know, you may not want to look like you've got too much going on uh, in terms of borrowings. But um, for the most part, the track record you want to set is I borrowed and I paid it down in a, in a you know, um, frugal and, you know, timely way and it shows on my record as having done that. So this example is that you purchased $2,000 worth of furniture with a credit card at an 18% interest rate, which uh, about six months ago was the average student rate. You buy nothing else with this credit card. All you do is you pay the minimum balance. 
on the credit card, which is 2% of the balance, or $15 at the point when 2% of the balance becomes um, lower than $15, okay? So I'm going to go through several slides. I'm going to flip through the slides. They're going to show you how long it takes to pay off the balance. And I, as I go through the slides, I want you to remember that every single line is a month of your life. All right? This, each, each line is a month of your life. Sorry, I keep feeling like I'm blocking you. So this is one, two. Yeah, they're each, each one is a year. Five, six, So here we are at the end. It took more than 23 years to pay off the balance. And we ended up paying more than three times the cost of the furniture. So this is also the power of compounding here. And what you can take from this is and from my talk is that your savings power is very strong right now. Even if you can only save small amounts, establishing a habit right now is going to be a, 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 a very big benefit to you. And also telling your friends and telling your children about their superpower and helping them to use it is um, is a great thing for them, right? Learn as much as you can about financial investments and loans that you have. Be smart about your savings and debt because if you know a little bit about the numbers and the math behind them, the smarter decisions you're going to be able to make. Most of you already have that advantage already. You've, you've taken the school that you need to do that. A lot of you have that. But this is just a refresher to remind you that the differences really make a profound difference in your financial future and that you can pass that on to people in your lives, your parents, you can help them, your children, your friends, and, um, and yourself. So, thank you. people feeling? Are you starving? I think I'm back on. Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Jen. That was very educational. I felt like I was back in the classroom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it really does drive home the point, though, why credit cards are bad, especially if they're charging high interest rates, and why it's in your interest to start as soon as possible with some savings. Um, and who was it that had the question about the credit score? Or the, um, so with credit scores, there's a lot of different factors the companies consider when coming up with your credit score. And generally, you want to have a higher credit score if you want to get a home mortgage someday. Um, and so it really depends on how many credit cards you have and if you've got other loan payments that you're making that can help uh, them see that you're a good payer of your debts. Um, but if you do have credit card debt and you don't have a gazillion credit cards and you pay it down, it's a good idea to have a couple of credit cards open because they look at your total debt capacity also. So if you've got a $20,000 credit limit on your credit cards, that shows them that someone's willing to trust you with that much credit capacity. So that's a good thing, even if you keep it paid off. Um, and I've actually had people and clients that they don't have student debt, they've never had a car loan, and so they have a, 
a very a low credit score because they haven't proven that they can handle having debt payments and paying back debt. So I had one young client, I just, in the past month, he's about to buy a new car and he has the savings, he could just go out and buy it for cash. But I'm like, you know, you don't have any other debt payments, you probably don't have a great credit score right now, so let's start establishing a credit history for you. Take at least a small car loan so that you can start building a good credit score. So. It's, it's a little hard to know exactly what they're looking at, but um, there's a lot of different factors. Yes? So looking at like balancing the bigger picture, mm -hmm. if you were to take the furniture loan in that example, um, and you also wanted to add to your savings, is it wiser to skew towards paying off that loan more quickly or instead of, and then double down on your retirement savings, or how does that? It kind of depends on the interest rate that you're paying on whatever that debt is. If it's high, like 15, 16, 18 percent, then you should probably focus on getting that paid off because investing your money, you're probably not going to earn anywhere near that much unless you're really lucky. Mm -hmm. um, that said, it can sometimes feel good to do a little of both. So maybe make more than the interest or the minimum payment on the debt and still be putting a little bit to get that compounding factor working for you. And then once that debt is paid off, then kind of redirect the money you were paying on the debt towards your savings goals. Jen, as would you? As, yeah. as far as what's considered like high right now on loans and debts, what, what is like a 5% or a 10% considered right now? That's probably, that's probably more on the fence because you can generally earn somewhere in that range on your investments if they're invested wisely. Um, so there you might do a little more balanced approach, but if you've got credit cards that are charging teens, in the teens, um, then you definitely want to focus on getting those paid off. Uh -huh. All right, so back on track here. Uh, we've only got 20, 15 minutes or a little bit more if I go over, so I'm going to try to uh, go pretty quickly through this. I apologize if I'm talking too fast. I realized when Jen came up that she talks at a very measured pace, and I'm like, God, I must have felt like I was running through things. No, 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 it's good. I'm sure if someone was, uh, you know, evaluating our speaking skills, I'd be like, yes, you need to slow down to me. <laughs> Anyway, I just get excited and I love this topic. So, um, so if you are able to start saving for retirement, um, it's a good idea to also not just save and leave them. I have people that leave the money sitting in cash. I'm like, it's great that you're saving, but you're not even keeping up with inflation. So if it's for the long term, you want to get it invested in a, in a wise fashion. Uh, another thing that's pretty common that people tend to believe is that, gee, we're all smart people. We have MBAs from Berkeley. We should be able to beat the market and figure out the investments to choose that are going to do better than, than average. The reality is there's a lot of smart people in the investment markets and a lot of them focus on it all day long. That's what they do for a living and some of them even have a, a nanosecond quicker access to trading than you might have. So it's really hard to beat the market and there's now a, a big body of research and you may have even seen some of it in your finance classes, investment classes, that it's really hard to beat the market successfully over the long term. Uh, and it a also happens to be that those mutual funds and managers that are trying to beat the market, they tend to trade more often and so they're not tax efficient and they ha charge higher expenses. So instead of paying them the higher expenses and being tax inefficient, it's better to just use index funds and exchange traded funds to diversify your portfolio and not worry so much about outsmarting the market. Um, and so in order to do, and this chart just shows the percentage of the active managers in different, uh, different asset classes that have failed to beat their relevant benchmark. And you can see it's well over 50% in almost every asset class. So instead of trying to find the few that might beat their benchmark, it's better to just use index funds and exchange traded funds. Um, and in addition to index funds and exchange traded funds, if you really want to keep it simple, particularly if you don't have a large amount of money yet, these target retirement funds that a lot of the 401k plans now offer or you can buy in your IRA are a good place to start because they'll actually invest in a broad array of asset classes and then they, as you get closer to retirement, they get more conservative and have more in bonds than in stocks. So they're actually a good one-stop shop if you just want to keep it simple. Um, and I like to tell people, um, you know, if, if you're feeling the need because things are scary and Jim Cramer is telling you to do this and CNBC <laughs> is telling you to do this and you feel like you've got to do something, then rebalance back to your long-term targets because that way at least you're acting and that will force you to do what's good in investment behavior, which is to buy things when they're low and sell them when they're high because they will have varied from your targets. Um, so that's a good way to feel, feel like you're doing something but do something that's actually good for your investments. Um, Okay, I think that's... I have a 
question. Yes, sorry, I don't mean to have my back to you. I think pretty specific to Silicon Valley, but what about those of us who get um, stock from our employers? Mm -hmm. um, it's so tempting to like look and like, oh, well, look where it's gone in the last 10 years when this company didn't exist All right. um, to keep it in your like in the stock, like mm -hmm. do you have any advice around that? Is there a percentage that you'd want to keep? Well, your stock versus diversify. Right. Um, I do have a fair number of clients that are in your situation and have options and RSUs and ESPP stock, sometimes all three. And if you're not paying attention to it, it can become a disproportionately large portion of your net worth. And that's risky because as long as it's in one company stock, particularly a, um, an early stage company, in my mind, it's kind of funny money. It doesn't really exist until you liqui liquefy it and diversify it. Um, and sometimes that's hard because you feel like you know the company and you know its prospects, you know it's gonna do well. And so you may not wanna get rid of all of it. So identifying some portion of your net worth that you feel comfortable having tied up in the um, company of your stock, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10%. I wouldn't go too much higher than 10% because you also have your human capital tied up in the you know the fate of that company so you've got a lot riding on one company's stock so if you're building wealth through equity compensation it's a good idea to diversify obviously you want to try and do it in a tax efficient manner but um, it's a good idea not to let too much get tied up in company stock all right any other questions before I move on keep us on time yes um, my son who's a, a, a ninth grader and a freshman in high school wants to buy stock already uh -huh. it's risky because he wants to invest yeah. <laughs> I think it's actually good that he's showing interest in it and some of the high schools have something called the stock market game that they offer where the kids can research stocks and pick which stocks they think are going to do better so it's a good way especially in high school for them to start learning about it um, you might just you know point out to him that it's good it's a good way to learn about companies and investing but you know for long-term money when he's older you know, picking stocks is probably not the best way to go. But even with clients that are saving for retirement and they like picking stocks, I'll be like, okay, let's put your long-term money in low-cost diversified index funds. But if you want to have a small pool of money that you can afford to lose and go play in the stock market, you know, knock yourself out. So it's actually good that he's showing interest in investing at such a young age. So I don't think that's a bad thing. And there are portfolio projects. You could even do one with your own children or your son. And you can buy a basket of stocks or invest in them or even, you know, we have, you know, uh, well, ideas, our kids are a little bit younger, but we have ideas to do a mock portfolio with our kids the way that I teach it in, in my course. And he can learn in that process that if you buy, you know, 20 plus stocks, uh, you can not only look at all of the different characteristics of them and learn about them, but buy things in different industries, buy things with opposite characteristics and see how they move against one another mm -hmm. and learn a lot about diversification in that process because they're not going to learn so much about diversification by just buying an index fund, but they can learn specifically about how stocks move against one another and learn specifically about diversification in that way. So in the process of wanting to invest in stocks, you can also teach about diversification. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, that's still, you teach them about smart investing. Good question. Did you have a question? I have a question. Um, in terms of targets, so I think mm -hmm. people talk a lot about index funds, et cetera. Is there a recommended um, 401k target of what individuals should invest in if you didn't want to go the route of um, target funds? In terms of allocation to bonds and stocks and things? Not necessarily or? just bonds and stocks, but of small versus mid versus large cap, et cetera. So. Um, I mean, it really depends on a lot of things, including kind of where you are in life, how young you are. Um, the traditional wisdom for just the stock versus bond allocation is you take 100 minus your age, and that's how much you should have in stocks. Um, but the thing is, it doesn't... It, that's kind of older advice. It's a good starting point, but you know people are living longer and longer, so you don't want to just keep reducing your uh, stock allocation in retirement until you have almost nothing because you can have a hard time staying ahead of inflation. But you know, you can start with some of the online. Cal uh, there's lots of online calculators to help you figure out asset allocation, because I don't believe you can beat the market. I tend to take um, the global market cap 
and just try and mirror what the global market cap looks like. And so the U.S. right now is call it 50-ish percent of the global market caps, cap. So of my U.S. or of my stock portfolio, I like to have about 50 percent in U.S. and 50 percent in foreign. And then you can also find a breakdown between in the U.S. large and small stocks. And I don't know what it is right now, but um, at one point it was like 70 percent was large stocks and 30 percent was small stocks. So you can kind of use the market as a good starting point and then if you want to try and tilt one way or another and overweight something you can do that although then you get into the you're trying to make bets on what things are going to do so a good place to start is just what the market is and you can usually look that up and find stuff like that online any other investing questions before we move on um, and we'll have hopefully time for a little Q&A at the end or you can always follow up by email with me uh, so a little less sexy topic but still very important um, you know, you, a lot of people like to focus on building their wealth, but they need to also focus on protecting their wealth and their family. Um, and so insurance is really the best, most cost-effective way to do that. And what, that, what, what insurance is really designed to do is to transfer the risk of high severity but low probability events to somebody else. Um, and that's the insurance company. And the way you do this in practice is you have insurance in place that has high deductibles so that you're self-insuring for the low, low severity events that might occur more frequently. But you have high limits so that if something really bad happens, the insurance company is going to cover that risk. Um, and so that's really kind of how you implement that um, philosophy or that approach. Um, so there, in addition to having you know, your homeowners, your auto, renters if you're a renter, policies, another type of insurance that a lot of people don't know about but I think is actually a great deal is umbrella liability insurance. I see some nodding heads so some people know about it. It sits on top of your underlying auto and homeowners policies so if there's a really catastrophic event and there's a lawsuit and it's multi-million dollar settlement or whatever, the umbrella insurance covers that so that you're not just decimated financially. The good thing is because it sits on top of your underlying policies and the odds of it actually being used are really low, it's really cheap. So you can get a million dollar policy and they usually start at a million for a few hundred dollars a year. So it's a very inexpensive but you know nice sleep at night type of insurance to have. Um, health insurance is very important. Most of you get it through your employers. Um, if you're healthy, there's health savings accounts now that are pretty widely available and they're a good way to get money. It's kind of like an IRA for health care. And so you can put money in and if you don't need it, it continues to grow in an IRA and you can even take it into retirement with you. As you know, health costs are not uh, going down and uh, that's a huge burden out there for people in their later years is their health care costs. So it's a nice way to save for health care costs. Um, life insurance, it's important for some people. Other people, it's not as relevant. It, it's really important if you have dependents, whether it's a partner or children or maybe a dependent parent. Um, and, you know, there's different types of insurance. I tend to be a fan of the term life insurance because it's pure insurance and it's the cheapest. Um, and there's different ways of figuring out how much you need, but you're trying to cover uh, the dependent's need for your income, basically. Um, and you can often get it through your employer, but it's not, the premiums will go up if you stay with your employer. And some employers offer a lot and other, other employers offer very little. So you don't want to take out two or three million dollars with an employer and then move jobs and find your employer only offers $50,000 and you've, you're older and less healthy now and you have to go out into the individual market to get more. So it's good to have a little of both. Um, disability insurance, that's another, usually an employee benefit that people don't really think about or don't understand. That basically pays you if something happens to you and you're unable to work for a period of time. It's really important. You're far more likely to be disabled during your working years than you are to die early. So it's really an important form of insurance. and. Uh, get it through your employer. If you can't, you can get it in the individual market. Um, so at any rate, let me see if I've got any other points on insurance. No, nope, I don't think so. Any questions before I move on? It's important. <laughs> uh, the other uh, topic that isn't as exciting as investing is um, estate planning and that's also about protecting your family and making sure your wishes are followed out. Um, you know, at a minimum, everyone needs a will, a financial, and a health care power of attorney. 
the will will say who gets what. The financial power of attorney says who can make decisions for you if something happens to you. And the health care says who can make health care decisions for you if something happens to you. Um, California is a state that has a pretty onerous probate process. So living trusts are very popular in California. Um, if you don't have a trust and your estate has to go through probate, it can take several years to get totally resolved. It's expensive. The courts take uh, three to five percent of your estate for legal fees and other costs. And it's public. Anybody can look at the public record and see what your estate's worth. So most people, if they've got a reasonable net worth, like to have a living trust set up. Um, and it's also a good idea as you may have heard, our estate laws have changed over the past few years and they're constantly evolving. So it's, a, it's not something that you just set and forget. You should look at it every five or 10 years to see if it's still relevant given the current estate uh, environment. For those of you with children or considering, considering having children, uh, the will is very important because it names guardians for your children. You don't want the courts to decide who gets to take care of your children, so having a will is very important. And the last little bit, um, I've seen a lot of people that draft the documents, but they never execute them, or they've executed them and they never fund their trust, or they never retitle their accounts, or they forget to change the beneficiaries. So finish the process, because it, it really, you spend all this money to get the documents drafted, and it's kind of wasted money if you haven't actually finished the process. So um, you can do it cheaply online. You can go to nolo.com and download software and do it for, you know, 50 bucks, especially if you just want to get some basic documents in place. Or you can pay an attorney a thousand or multi-thousand dollars to do the process for you and be more customized. What is the website again? nolo.com, N-O-L-O.com. On living trust, would you recommend? Oh, is, is, uh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, on living trust, is NOLO okay, or do you recommend because it's just so complicated going with an attorney? You can certainly do a living trust using Quick and Willmaker or some of the yeah. software that you can get from NOLO.com. I find that they're very cookie cutter though, and they don't allow for much customization. And then you don't have someone helping make sure you finish the process properly. Um, so it's a good place to start. But if you have any particular customization you'd like to do, um, or want a little more handholding, then I'd go with an attorney. Okay, thank you. Good question though. Any other? It's such an exciting topic. Where are the questions? <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, did we have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Um, you always could benefit from having a will and the powers of attorney. It really becomes more critical uh, once you have children because you want to name guardians for your children. So it's not as critical. Just know that you know, if something happens to you, then you may not have control over who's going to help you and make decisions for you and whatnot. And like I said, if, if your situation is simple, you don't have kids yet, go to NOLO and just quickly do an easy one because then at least you've got something in place. And then as your situation evolves and gets a little more complex, then it might be worth paying someone to draft the documents for you. Good question. All right, um, so when people hear the word financial plan, they picture a map, or at least a lot of people do, that once you've got it, you're set. And you can just kind of be on autopilot. The reality is, your life is changing, your situation's changing, tax laws change, estate laws change, a lot of stuff changes. And so you really shouldn't just set and forget it. You really should review it periodically to make sure you're staying on track and that nothing big has changed that would cause the path you're taking to change. And so this is just a frequency that I use with clients in terms of evaluating different pieces of their plan. So I like to look, I meet with my clients once a year for an annual review and we look how they're tracking versus their goals. Like have they maxed out their 401k? Have they contributed what they were supposed to contribute to their 529 plans? You know, just making sure they're on track. Uh, I also look at portfolios for uh, my financial planning clients at least one a year, once a year. Uh, retirement projections, you know, if things are pretty stable in your life every couple of years, re revisiting, but if you change your career and you get a new job that pays a lot more or you decide to take some time off, it's a good idea to revisit those. Uh, looking at your insurance every three years or so is a good idea, both because your needs change and because the market pricing, marketplace changes. Uh, and then your estate plan, usually every five years or so, just to make sure your wishes haven't changed, like you've had kids, or you don't like that person anymore that was supposed to make these decisions for you, or the estate laws, they change too. So don't set and forget. It's a good idea to, um, to review different pieces periodically. All right, now we don't have time. Okay. It's lunchtime, but can you guys hang for a few more minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, 
Another thing I like to tell people is be flexible. Life is uncertain, life is dynamic. Um, the market returns are highly vari variable and uncertain. So the best thing you can do to ensure that you lead a happy life is to be flexible and know that things might not turn out exactly as you had envisioned. And so if you have several options you're willing to consider, that'll make things turn out a lot better for you than they might otherwise. And it's much easier to make small adjustments earlier in life than wait until you're about to retire to see if you need to make changes, because then you might need to make big changes. So that whole compounding thing that Jen was talking about. Uh, I'm not going to go over this because there were only a few parents in the room, but it's in the presentation that you can either get from me or they may have accessible. Um, there were, there's a fair, peop, fair number of you that might have student debt, so I thought um, talking about student debt briefly might be worthwhile. Um, it can depend, how quickly you pay it off can depend on a variety of things. One is how much you have. Uh, two is the interest rate. Three is what your career plans and other goals might be. Um, generally, if your interest rate is low, you don't necessarily need to feel like you need to pay it off super quickly and make more than the payments, you know, the agreed upon payments. Um, one thing that's changed, oh wait, I've got that down there. Um, however, if the balance is high, even if the interest rate is low, it might impact your ability to get a mortgage down the road or save for retirement or some of these other things. So in that case, particularly if you have the income, it's a good idea to kind of work it down some. Um, another thing that's interesting is they've now got a variety of different repayment options and you can actually get your debt forgiven if you go into certain career paths. So I know most of you are in business. I don't know, how, do, are any of you considering a career in uh, the social sectors or government or anything like that. Okay, so there are repayment plan options then where you can get it forgiven after a period of time. Um, one thing that's interesting and that's changed since I was in school is the whole consolidate or not consolidate um, has, the, that argument has changed. It used to be that uh, loans when they were issued had variable rates and you could consolidate to lock in a low long-term fixed rate. And so it was very popular when I was coming out of school to consolidate your loans. Nowadays, they, when they're issued, they have a fixed rate. And you don't want to consolidate if your interest rates vary because you can tackle your debt and pay off the one that has the highest interest rate first and then move on to the next one. Uh, whereas if you consolidate, you're kind of locking in one interest rate for all your debt. That said, if you have a bunch of loans and they were all issued within the same time, you know, similar time frame and have similar interest rates, then you might just want to consolidate to simplify. Um, and then I don't know a ton about these, but there's the income-based repayment plan and the pay-as-you-go uh, repayment plan, but these are really better if you're considering a career in social service, and I think you need to decide upon them at the time you start repaying your loans. And this is a website I really like for getting more information on uh, student loans, askheatherjarvis.com. Let's see, that was it. Um, yes, we're almost done. <laughs> so this is just to summarize, those are all my top 10 points. Um, I had one bonus thing that I wanna talk about. I'm also, as I mentioned up front, really passionate about getting more women into my field because I love what I do and it's very rewarding. Both financially, I have great work-life balance, I love helping people, so uh, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes letting you know why it's so great and why we need more of you in the field. Um, so if you'll bear with me. All right, so there's two big points. One is there's real need to have more women in financial planning, and two, it's a great career for women. So uh, financial planning tends to get lumped into finance and investment careers more broadly, and so women don't realize that there's different characteristics of the different careers within finance. And so there's there's a shockingly low proportion of women that are cer certified financial planners and do financial planning, only 25%, and that's kind of consistent with broader finance. It's also what you see if you look at engineering and some of the other really technical fields. And it's really a shame, because we make up 50% or more of the population and more than 50% of college grads now and stuff like that. So uh, we need more women. Um, we also, as a gender, control a lot of wealth, and that's only increasing. Uh, so there's not enough of us in the field and more and more women are controlling more wealth and oftentimes women prefer to work with other women. It just is. <laughs> um, now on the flip side, 
it's a really great career for women, and, and they often don't realize it because they assume it's, you know, it's like investment banking or you need to be a rocket scientist with numbers and stuff. But in reality, you know, the stuff she went over is way more than you even need to know to be a good financial planner. If you have a financial calculator and can punch numbers in, you don't need to do all that advanced math that Jen was showing you. Um, you just have to have a good basic number sense. Um, the other side of it is it really requires a lot of the softer skills and the emotional IQ that women tend to be more naturally uh, equipped with. And so you have to really have a good ability to listen to people and is listen actively. You have to be able to empathize with them, build relationships, all that stuff that comes naturally to women. Um, the other thing I love about it is, particularly if you build your own business, you can have a great work-life balance and a very flexible schedule. I have two young kids. I pick them up from school at three every day. I can make time in my day to go help out in the classroom or go on field trips. So it, it really allows a lot of control over your schedule. Uh, and then just because you're helping people realize their dreams, it's very emotionally satisfying. So I really love what I do and I can't really see myself doing anything else at this point. So that's my plug. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in wrapping up, if you get three things out of my part of the talk, they are take responsibility for your own finances, uh, proactively manage your human capital throughout your career, and finally consider a career in financial planning. Um, at any rate, do we have any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think because you don't have the income yet, focusing on the expense side of the equation and getting a handle on what your expenses are and trying to live within a reasonable amount of what you expect to be earning when you get out of school is a good idea. And then just having in the back of your mind that as soon as I do have an income, I need to live on less than I'm earning so that I can start saving for retirement. I think that's helpful. And maybe, you know, trying to manage your, your debt as well and not get too much, take on too much debt. Yes? Is there a list of resources or books or articles that you recommend? I know that, like, Get Financially Naked is a good one for speaking uh -huh. about money with your partner. There are some other good ones, and I was just wondering what your top uh, picks Top on. books. Um, well, I mentioned this one earlier. I love this one for women. It's very empowering. Um, a basic primer on financial topics are the Wall Street Journal guides to investing and guides to personal finance. Those are a good kind of basic primer. Um, if you have children, um, I like Raising Financially Fit Kids by, I think it's Jolene Godfrey. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's tons of good books out there. So, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. Just taking the initiative to actually learn and read about that. And there's lots of good kind of not um, online resources too. Like I think CNBC has a personal finance primer online. There's a lot of good kind of online resources as well. Thanks. Anything else? We starving? <laughs> All right, well, um, I've got resources on either side. Take a card if you want to ask me questions after the fact. And thanks for coming. Thank you so much.